Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Michelle Tovar. I am Associate Director of Education and Latino Initiatives here at Holocaust Museum Houston. Thank you for joining us tonight for our first program in celebration of Black History Month. We would like to thank our co-sponsor, Houston Coalition Against Hate, for their continued support in racial justice programming. Holocaust Museum Houston recognizes that Black history should be celebrated every day, and we stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of hosting Cam Franklin, who is a singer, songwriter, activist, writer, motivational speaker, and actress from Houston, Texas. She is best known for her work with the Gulf Coast soul band, The Suffers. But Cam began performing in the, performing in the public at age five, a three-time recipient of the Houston Press Music Award for Best Female Vocalist, Cam has performed on five continents and has performed with the Suffers, backed by the Houston Symphony, in addition to being featured solo. Both Forbes and Vice have featured Cam for her activism and business ventures that seek to create an inclusive environment in the arts for female artists working in all mediums from all backgrounds. The first part of our program is pre-recorded and Cam will be joining us live afterwards for questions. We ask that you please submit your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box and we will try to get as, uh, to as many as we can. Without further ado, Nine Pieces by Cam Franklin. Hi, my name is Cam Franklin. I am so happy to be here today and I want to just say thank you so much for having me. The piece that I'm going to present to you today is called Nine Pieces, and I'm really excited about it because I feel like it's a, a real reflection uh, not only of how I feel about the state of things right now, uh, but it's a real reflection of the last 15 years of my life. And... Uh, everything that has really led up to this time. So thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy my piece, Nine Pieces. Nine Octobers ago, I had nine pieces of metal taken out of my ankle, nine of them. I can't even begin to tell you how painful this was. But we have a little time. So let's get into it. Two years prior to getting my metal taken out of my ankle, I had a pretty bad bicycle injury. It resulted in my bones coming out of both sides of my ankle and that's where this story begins i was supposed to leave for tour one week later as a backup singer and dancer for this group out of the uk called the very best i ended up going on the tour in a cast and with a brand new purple spray painted walker to match the tour clothes tour colors in tow I had the absolute best time of my life for about two weeks. The group I went out with was called The Very Best. The Very Best are a dance group slash duo from London and Malawi. I got connected with them through my work with legendary music writer, DJ, and tour manager, Matt Sanzala. They just done a few tracks with Ezra from Vampire Weekend, Santa Gold, and MIA, so I knew the tour was gonna to be super high energy and lots and lots of fun. Ezra actually ended up sitting in with us at our New York date at Le Poison Rouge, and I still remember the whole night. The energy was high, everybody was dancing, except for me, I was in a chair, and uh, occasionally bopped around in my walker, but uh, the, the memory of that night still rings so strongly in my mind. After the show though, someone accidentally dropped a laptop on my leg and it busted two of my surgical stitches open. Hello, good morning pain. Uh, <laughs> if I didn't know it before that injury and surgery, I definitely knew it then. 
uh, I was grateful for all of the painkillers I had, but it's a pain that when I think about it, I feel it in my whole body. Two days later, I got the spirit on stage in Los Angeles. We we're playing at this venue called the Echoplex. If you're not familiar with the Echoplex, it's where every big artist plays on their way up. It's like the Roxy or, or uh, the Beacon, and not the Beacon in New York. It's like, uh, excuse me, it's like Rockwood Music Hall or uh, Fitzgerald's when it was still in Houston or the small room at White Oak or uh, the mid-sized room at uh, House of Blues in Houston. It's just a mid mid-sized room, you know? And however, when you fill it up with tons of people and energy and live music, no matter who's playing, it's an automatic party because the way that the bar and club is laid out, everything's to the back and everything in front is dance floor except for the stage. And it's just energy, energy, energy. So on this particular night, the show was sold out. I was to the max. Uh, level of excitement. I think it was probably my first time playing to that many people ever in Los Angeles. It might have been my first time playing uh, on stage in Los Angeles, actually. And I, I was just so excited. Um, well, what happened? <laughs> I got on, I got on stage, we get through a few songs. And I see my fellow backup dancer, Josie Ann, going in she's dancing she's gorgeous super fit i am in my my chair i see my cast i see my purple walker on the side of the stage pretty far away uh but this the song it just starts calling my name i'm like all right here i go uh oh so i start dancing on one leg for about two minutes <laughs> And uh, you know what? Instead of me telling you what happened, I'm going to read a direct quote from uh, the review of the show uh, that was put out in the LA Weekly. This is from April 2009. Excuse me. This is from July 2009. Sitting down, a second woman sings back up, seemingly adrift in the music. Suddenly, she snaps to attention and rises to join her fellow dancer. Following two minutes of frenetic shimmying, she attempts to sit back down, misses her target, and crashes to the floor. Rather than be embarrassing, her smile only expands, tactically explaining that this is one big party and who cares how you look? <laughs> Honestly, that paragraph described my entire tenure on that tour. I was so happy to be there. And some people might have been asking, why did they bring a girl with a broken leg on tour? Well, I didn't mention that I was the only backup singer and the language that we were singing in was Chinchetua, the, lang <laughs> the national language of Malawi. And I don't speak the language, but I'm really good at uh, phonetics and diction and just recalling that and singing it. And uh, Asal, who is the lead singer who is actually from Malawi, loved my voice and loved loved my interpretation of what he was doing and invited me along with Johan, his partner, uh, in, in the very best to come and do this music. And I was just so grateful for the opportunity. And that's where the good part of the story takes a little bit of a turn. That night in Los Angeles, even though years later I eventually got to play the Echoplex under my own band and I've had many memories there, that particular night, the first time at the Echoplex, will permanently live rent-free in my mind. But the pain and consequences that followed going on that tour soon followed. My doctor kept it real with me when I came back. I went in for a post-op checkup and my ankle was swollen, nasty swollen. I had a really bad infection. He told me to go on antibiotics. 
and that I would not be allowed to have any weight bearing on my leg for three months. No walking, just sitting my booty down and heal it because that's how bad it was. And if I didn't do it, he told me it would only get worse. A broken ankle won't heal if you keep trying to walk on it. Trust me, I learned this the hard way. And every time I refused to accept that rest was the only way for me to cover, to recover, I was forced to sit out from the things I loved even more as my body repeated the healing process over and over again. While I was resting, a lot happened. I got replaced on the next tour because I couldn't tour. And I won't lie, it damn near broke me. I cried tears of joy and sadness when I watched them play late night TV without me. I couldn't work for a while because of the injury and I eventually slipped into a very, very deep depression. During this time, I had to pivot from my creative work into my former life as an admin so that I could make a living while sitting down. I temporarily worked for a few short office jobs before I landed an incredible job as an executive assistant at an Australian investment bank here in Houston. Working there was a dream at first. I was making more money than I ever had. I was finally paying off my bills that had stacked while I was recovering from my ankle injury. And this office felt like a whole new world. The trade floor there was something like you'd see more so in London or Wall Street, rather than the traditional vision that you normally see of Houston, Texas and popular culture. There were people from all over the world and the office was filled with different accents, cultures and ideas. I worked in that role for two years before I was eventually promoted into an entry level trade analyst position. I was so overwhelmed at first but I was lucky enough to be surrounded by a team of people that guided me into a confidence that I still stand in every day. At this point, I figured my dreams of being on stage every night were over. I had developed a limp following my last surgery and I had started to hear a click when I positioned my ankle a certain way. Click, click, click. I was so busy at work that sometimes it would be hours before I would hear the click. Click, click. Hearing that click meant I was moving, walking, doing something. But hearing it started to drive me crazy. Well, not moving, becoming sedentary. You know what happens. One year of clicking later, I get a phone call, my old friend, Pat Kelly, and then a text message, my old friend, Adam Castaneda. Hey, we're starting this new band. It's gonna be called The Sufferers. We later changed it to The Suffers. You should come check it out. I show up to the rehearsal. There's like 10 dudes there and me. Okay, let's go. Where's my microphone? It was so fun. Rock steady, ska, jazz, R&B, freeform, trip hop, punk, break it, whatever we wanted. It was, it was awesome. And we just had a really, really great time figuring it all out. <sighs> Singing with them made me feel like I was on my way back. Except for one thing, I couldn't dance the way that I used to. And that clicking that I knew was coming from the metal they put in my ankle was starting to drive me insane. So for the first time in my adult life, I used that adult health insurance that came with having a good ass job. And I went to get my healed up ankle and these clicks checked out. My new surgeon confirmed that one of the screws had shifted, but that it could easily be removed with the surgery. 
due to how well the ankle had healed. What? I got a healed ankle? Oh my, your girl got a healed ankle, y'all. Oh my God. Mm. So <laughs> I got the surgery two weeks later and that click was gone when I left the hospital. A month later, so was the limp. I started dancing again and I even ran a half marathon. A few years into the job at the bank, I got promoted again and started making more money than I ever had. But then I ended up getting the opportunity of a lifetime. The band had been doing well, like really well, like selling out every show we played everywhere we went well. And then we played South by Southwest and met a lot of people, they loved us, but they were like, do you guys tour? What do you mean do we tour? I have a job. I'm an oil and gas trade analyst. What do you mean do I tour? I mean, you guys are good, the Sully sounded. You guys are good, but I mean, if you're not playing in New York, if you're not playing CMJ, you're just a, you know, another big band from the South, another another soul band, brass band from the South, and there's tons of those. And I'm like, don't nobody, what are you talking about? There's only one of us. So be it opportunity, be it a need to prove somebody wrong, be it a want to prove it to myself that I could do it. Myself and my nine bandmates at the time made the drive, the flight, the all the ways that we could to New York City that first time because we didn't have a van yet. And we played about eight shows at CMJ. And our last show in New York City, a producer for The Late Show at David Letterman saw our show. We played the show three months later. I can't, I quit my day job on January 30th of 2015. And up until last March, I had been on the road full time ever since. COVID-19 ruined a lot of things, that's true. But that particular pandemic is not what this conversation is about. None of these opportunities would have ever happened had I not found a reason to hold myself and that damn click accountable. Those months I spent on the couch wondering what if, those years I spent at the bank, toughening up my skin, prepared me for the life that I have now. A life in an ever-changing music industry that doesn't quite understand people that look like me or sound like me or speak up like me. How? Well, working in the bank, it's like, you know, a normal corporate job. Lots of diversity and inclusion training, which I realized is not very normal outside of corporate jobs, especially the music industry. I don't understand a lot of creative industries have not gone through these steps. A lot of these industries have not gone through basic steps on sexual harassment. And it's because a lot of these industries for a long time were not looked at as real industries. I'm not gonna get into the politics of it all, but I know what it is I do and who it is that I am. And I will say, that I learned so many lessons from that bank. But the most important one that I learned is that anyone is capable of soaring to new heights with proper guidance, training, opportunity, and leadership. Working there wasn't perfect. It was not the perfect company in any kind of way. And like any company, it had many flaws but it gave me an opportunity to succeed in my life at a time where I felt like I was failing at everything. It also showed me how to run a smooth company when everyone is treated with respect 
and given that same dream, same team communication. When I left the world of oil and gas for rock and roll full time, I never expected to encounter the immense levels of racism and sexism that I experienced those first few years. The craziest part about it is how normalized everything was. Things that would get the average person fired back at my corporate job, harassment, physical assault, various racial incidents, verbal abuse, financial inequalities, and more. Those were all normal in the music industry. What had I gotten myself into? I started speaking up because that's what I was taught to do. But I got to learn what happens when you speak up. The blacklisting, the blackballing, the gossip, the lies. Speaking up about it was terrifying every time I did it. And it still is every time I do it. But I keep doing it. I started speaking up whenever I noticed anything that was off or even worse when I became the victim of the inequalities. I started writing about it all and keeping track so that I could spread the word about whenever I saw these inequalities and the different types of injustices that I was seeing on the road. I started calling out the uneven festival lineups. I started calling out the lack of women on the radio. I started calling out the lack of representation at the executive level. I started asking people why the inequalities existed. I started asking how to fix them and how I could ignite the same curiosity that I had in others. Even though I say this with a lot of joy in my tone, a lot of people in the positions of power were not trying to hear it. Their systems were just fine to them. Seeing one or two black artists on a festival bill filled with 90 white artists, mostly male, normal. They didn't see anything wrong. It didn't make any sense to me, even though they looked at it as groundbreaking diversity. Maybe it was my obsession with data or those long ass diversity trainings I sat through when I was at the bank, but I didn't quit my day job to have my opportunities controlled by gatekeepers that saw nothing wrong with the lack of inclusion in this industry. Knowing that you might be punished, blackballed, or worse, for doing what you know is right is what makes doing it even more scary. But every time, and I mean every time, I took a moment to say something. I thought about all the black women that came before me that didn't have the power that I have now to do so. Their strength is what propels me to keep going every day. To add, I'm from Houston, Texas, the land of Beyonce, Barbara Jordan, the rodeo, and some of the best food you will ever have the pleasure of eating from cultures all around the world. I grew up in a diversity filled environment where I was told that I could do anything that I wanted with hard work. And I still believe that. Unfortunately, my constant pestering became a thing of legend that led to industry blackballing and lost opportunities until last year. 2020, the year of multiple pandemics, outside of everything that was going on with COVID-19, almost every single industry was being called out for racist practices following the murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and so many other Black people that didn't need to die. It was a strange, strange time. 
It was as if the collective trauma we had all shared watching George Floyd die over those eight minutes and 46 seconds finally gave me and every other person of color out there suffering permission to be heard. Summer 2020 is one that I will never forget because it felt like a surreal episode of The Twilight Zone or some other sci-fi film where all the pushback and all the trauma I had spent a lifetime fighting against suddenly paused for a brief moment in time due to the guilt and shame of a nation being presented to itself on repeat in 4K everywhere the internet flows. So many people that once hurt me or my career sent messages apologizing for their racism or their behavior. It was so weird, so weird. I felt weird because I'm grieving. We were grieving. We're all still grieving. We will never stop. Grieving. While I didn't respond to every single message that was sent to me, I forgive every single person. I cannot and I will not live with hate on my heart. I truly hope and believe that every single one of these people have learned and that they will continue to learn and live with, that they will continue to learn to live and love their black and brown neighbors because it is the only way that we can truly progress as a nation together. The riot that happened at the Capitol on January 6th, 2020, will go down in history as a dark day in America. There is no getting around it. That does not mean that we are not capable of growing from it. America, much like the rest of the world, is in dire need of collective healing. That means being optimistic about the idea that we all have room for improvement. That doesn't mean celebrating a new president and assuming that everything is fine now. That means learning to listen, even when you don't always agree. That means standing up and speaking out when people try to harm others, especially those that can't defend themselves. And lastly, that means understanding that all of us being so different is what makes this world so beautiful. It's gonna take time and there will be mistakes and everyone will not be happy as we transition into this next era as a nation and as a society. But when I look back at how far we have come, I know, I know anything is possible. When I got those nine pieces of metal taken out of my ankle, I got my sanity back. I could dance, I could walk, and I could move in ways I hadn't before. But I would have never gotten there had I not taken the time to pause and heal. Every time I tried to speed up the process, ignore what I knew I needed to do, or race through it all, I slowed my recovery down. I look at this moment in time the same way that I look at those nine pieces of metal. Painful, transformative, but worth it. I thank you so much for your time. And I wanna to present to you the musical part of this piece, nine pieces. Thank you.
to be found the next day the truth ring hard or them shots with no regard or this young black light this first responding queen Now I know the last two songs were a little dark and that's where we're at, but it doesn't have to be like that forever. I know the best days are ahead of us. And I wanna say thank you so much for coming, for watching, for tuning in. Thank you so much to the Holocaust Museum for having me. This performance of Nine Pieces has been on my mind and on my heart for so long. And I'm so grateful that during this last song, uh, I get to make a dream come true for myself. The day that this metal got out of my body and uh, into this little tube, I've kept it this whole time. I always had the vision of adding it to a song. So uh, y'all get to be a part of this moment while I release what was once a burden and I make it a piece of art. And I hope that you allow yourself to have a good time during this last one. I tried to make it a little bit uh, upbeat because I believe that there's range to grief and sadness and there's also range to joy and happiness. So let's have a good time. This is Nine Pieces. Thank you so much for coming.
Thank you so much for joining us again, everyone. And we do have Cam live right now. We'll be answering a few questions. Um, that was such a wonderful piece and, and great performance. Thank you so much, Cam, for joining us tonight. This is cool. Yes. <laughs> virtual. Questions from the audience, um, actually from some educators who are interested oh. in, in getting your perspective. How can educators utilize the arts to, uh, to support their students as they discover the importance of their voices? Uh, well, I think it starts with asking the students, you know, first. I recently started doing, well, I won't say I recently because I've been doing it. I've been working with kids for the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, but usually how we get connected to schools is through schools reaching out to us directly. However, there is so, so many formalized, you know, programs out there. Now I know things cost money. I know people, you know, funding is few and far in between for some folks uh, right now. Um, but the thing is, is that when you put out a need, sometimes you find what it is you're looking for. Uh, and I say that literally by having it happen as recently as about two days ago. So there's a festival uh, out of uh, New England called Newport Folk Festival. And they have a foundation called Newport Folk Festival Foundation, which uh, is a part of their jazz folk festival up there, as well as the New Orleans Jazz Festival, their sister festivals. But beyond the festival part, what they really do is support uh, different things like music education, uh, artists that need help on the, you know, when they run into 
emergencies and just different philanthropic things. And so what they have uh, now and they've been having for a very long time are these direct to the classroom experiences where they have different touring musicians that are interested in working with kids um, do short programs, you know, usually maybe like a 15 minute uh, song uh, show for the kids and then like a 15 minute Q and A where, you know, the kids aren't gonna talk to us the way that they talk to educators. You know, it's a very different thing. Like meanwhile, we, we're like, oh my God, teachers, oh my God, this is amazing. But you know, the kids are like, oh, whatever. And uh, as part of the programming that we do, um, we try to encourage young students. I am a product of the HISD Magnet School program. Uh, I went to Cornelius Elementary and I had, I was so lucky to have been in magnet schools from day one. And I know the difference that it has made. Uh, my peers that have gone through those programs have talked about it. Every school is not a magnet school. And because I know that, I try to keep in mind that the people that had those impacts on me were part of those programs that were just normal at the magnet school, you know, the, 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 the good music teachers, the good, pro, the DARE programs, you know, and because of that, I, I actually had the opportunity recently to start talking to students about, okay, well, what is it that you like? And, you know, they're like, oh, I like little, I like uh, Billie Eilish, or I like Juice World. I like this person. I go, okay, well, what do you like about it? Uh, well, I like how, how, how it sounds like this. And that school up there was using a software called Soundtrap. And Soundtrap is a program that you can learn how to make your own beats, right? And so the workshop I did with the students was, you know, taking beats that they had been working on all semester. And then I just remixed them, added vocals and explained to them how to make these beats. But then when I got done with my little spiel about the music and how fun this was, I got very real with them and I let them know, if you're gonna do this music stuff for real, um, and I always say one bad word because kids, they, they listen so much more if you, if you give them just one, one. They're like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I let them know, I didn't like math, but you have to be in math. Otherwise someone's gonna steal from you when you become a rock star. It's like, I didn't like, uh, a lot of classes outside of English and music, I said, but I had to learn everything because you start learning the foundation. And I said, people always ask about stage fright and writer's block. I said, all those other subjects you learn in school, they're there to help you. You run, you run out of things to talk about, talk about the stars, talk about astronomy, write a song about plants. You're, you're not in love. Okay, write a song about how how much you don't like math. People can relate to that and they will want to listen. And you know, and we started making these hip hop beats, but with kids, the same thing. You have to remember what it was like when you were young. You'd want somebody to relate to you. You don't want somebody talking to you like a baby. And when it comes to music, you want to feel like you can do it. And I tell like Y'all just saw me do this whole set with a guitar and making all these beats. I learned how to make these make beats on you know technology mm -hmm. two years ago. I learned how to start really playing guitar at the beginning of quarantine. And I tell these kids that because it's important. Yes, I'm a, I'm a trained musician with my voice and I've you know ha had the opportunity to have a jump start on how it all works because of that. However, it's the practice of everything else. And I know this isn't just about education, but I could have a whole conversation on um, how heartbreaking it is to hear about schools not having music funding, having all this money for sports. What kept me from getting barefoot and pregnant was because I had a bus ride home for my choir competitions. Because mm -hmm. I would shoot. I was out here trying to mingle, but you know what? I didn't have somebody in my life telling me those boys will be around. I didn't have somebody in my life telling me, hey, those boys will be around. Focus on the everything else. But it takes a village to, to raise these kids and it takes a village to raise these adults because we just go out into the real world trauma, you know, with no real nurturing, assuming everybody's against us. And you know, when people that are actually here for us start showing up, it becomes so confusing. And it's, you know, we have to lead with love. We have to lead with, you know, empathy and, and compassion and encouragement. 
and not assume that, you know, we're all built the same way or that we all are, are out here trying to do the same life. Because somebody that wants to be a football star might not want to be a lawyer, might not want to do music, might not want to go up into space with the SpaceX boys, you know, or in ladies and everybody. But it's like, we have to focus on building well-rounded individuals, not just you know, these images of like what we think would be cool because everybody we idolize, they up to some shit. <laughs> so it's like, we gotta like, we gotta focus on just making good humans. Well, Sorry, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people look up to you and a lot, a lot of younger people uh, who obviously, you know, love your music, look up to you, but who have been some of your influences growing up, some activists, some artists? Oh man, uh, I always loved, any artist that did whatever they wanted. So uh, the earliest example uh, that I had was Tina Turner and her biopic, uh, What's Love Got to Do With It? We had the VHS and I should not have been watching it. I should not have, but I was definitely watching it every single day. Uh, mm -hmm. So definitely Tina Turner, uh, Dolly Parton, Prince. I always loved that both of them could play so many instruments. If, it, if you've ever, had the joy of going to either of their shows, especially when people haven't seen Dolly live. They're like, what, she plays saxophone? I go, yes, you have, and the drums, you have to go. Uh, but I, I love artists that are just, you know, fearless. I've been really into Gagoosh recently. Uh, I say recently, like in like the last 10 years, I think that's new to be into her because she has such a, a huge uh, repertoire. And I, I love, absolutely love um, what this new artist, Nick Hakim has been doing. And uh, I just love Texas music as a whole. Like Houston is filled with so many talented artists, uh, Sugar Joy Co, Lenora, uh, Madeline Edwards. You know, I just, I, especially so many women and it's, it's incredible. And I feel so lucky uh, to be working in an era where, you know, seeing women on the keys or on the drums or on the bass is like so normal. Um, and I tell people, you know, when I was coming up in Houston, the only other black woman I saw at the jams that were at the rock jams, not the, the R&B jams, it was everybody, right? Mm -hmm. But when I would go to the rock jams, there'd be two other black women there. My friend Osley from the Tauntauns and Lizzo. And now I tell these young women as they're coming up, I said, y'all can be the next anything you, be the next anything you want because Aside from her, you know, the same thing with Krungbin. When they were coming up, it's like we were all coming up together. It's like every generation is going to have its stars if y'all keep going. And I try to encourage, again, back to the kids, but it, mm -hmm. it's really always about them. I let them know, like, it doesn't matter what kind of music you're making. It's like, your parents are going to hate it anyway, you know? <laughs> so, like, don't worry about, about that. If this is what you really want to do, just like if you want to be a doctor, if you want to do anything else, you got to keep going. And so... I'd look at artists that kept going. So the Roots have probably been um, my band's like greatest inspiration as far as like, wow, like we can, we can do this as a big band. Mm -hmm. And then seeing our buds in New Orleans, it's Tank and the Bangas, like seeing them, you know, do the exact same thing. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, to people that don't know how the music industry works, they might think, oh, well, the Suffers had a run, uh, they're done, you know, it's been a few years. I'm like maybe it's been a few years in America. <laughs> I, love tell, I love telling young black and brown people, if you can play your ass off for real, you'll always have a job literally everywhere else as a musician. If you want to do the work, you will always have a job. But America makes us think we're small and all the other negative, negative stuff. America needs some self-love so that Americans can love a little better is how I feel about it all. Well, that brings me to my next question. Um, how do you think the public can support artists um, as they work to create an anti-racist music industry? Because you talked a little bit about that in your in your talk. Mm -hmm. uh, supporting their advocacy, uh, supporting uh, organizations like uh, Color for Change or uh, local uh, organizations like Shape Community Center in Third Ward, which is has raised generations of mm -hmm. us little troubled troubled kids and you know loved us through it all um but also when it comes to supporting them directly 
going to those artists merch stores like if, if there's a black artist that you like and you know especially if you know they're an independent black artist you know i'm not the only one out there there's tons of us out there but like going to their their merch stores and buy, buying their stuff directly buying their music buying it listening to music anywhere other than spotify spotify and i say that because they don't pay their artists uh fairly and that's a whole other conversation but like if you really trying to go against the system like that that's some like today stuff you can do um but beyond that i would say the biggest thing and it's also the scariest thing that i talked about is speaking up you know i i did this speech before everything that's happening today went down and I know it was all 2021. I could tell. I was like, January must have just been 2020 part two for real. Cause I I love that I said that. But um when I when I started looking at everything and thinking back, I was just like, okay, we we have such an opportunity right now to do something so big and so different. And you know, I'm looking at what other cities are doing right now and seeing how I can be of service without spreading myself too thin. So um, I am trying to uplift other voices, but the biggest thing people can do is speak up, speak up, speak up, speak up, because I can only do so much as a marginalized person. You can only do so much as a marginalized person. Right. The people that know the privilege and <laughs> the level of influence that you hold due just to systematic racism and colorism. We ain't got us, we, we know what it is. I don't have to explain it. We all know what it is. <laughs> but what I do need to explain is I'm tired of having my money messed with because I'm defending myself. Mm. I, do you know what I saw on the evening news today? the big trend right now, black women wearing their natural hair, the big trend. What other race has to beg to do whatever they want to their hair? And I ain't calling nobody out, but I wear this wig because I want to. And I wore Afro because I want to and because mm -hmm. I can't. And anybody should be able to wear what they want to their job as long as it's you know fitting and it's what it is and anybody should be allowed to be whatever it is they want to be but natural hair i have to have permission not to chemically treat my hair mm -hmm. because of european standards that have been extended from the slavery era that mm -hmm. was on the five o'clock news in wow. houston texas in 2021 after the year we just had. If you wanna dig deeper, Google the Crown Act. It is absolutely insane, but it is the basic racism that exists that I have to talk about. It's why I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna get some tattoos and really go for this because I am just tired. I am tired. And you know, even though I'm in this music industry now and I get to wear my hair how I want and I get to you know, come correct whatever i am learning the consequences mm -hmm. of standing up for other people in an industry where that's not normal mm -hmm. where people are controlled by money and this is a lot of other industries this isn't just music mm -hmm. but without going on an extended rant which i already have it's mm -hmm. just the biggest thing people can do is speak up speak up speak up and it's not always going to be comfortable it's not always going to be uh, an, okay, yeah, you're right, man. You know, sometimes they're going to be jerks, but it's, you have to think about the people that spoke up for the people that came for you, before you, right? The people that have allowed you to be comfortable, especially if you're a woman, especially if you're a white woman, you have to think about the power that you hold to just tell somebody to, hey, man, can you not, can you, can you not be that? Can you not be that person? Like if it apply, it, it's pretty easy. Like I, I tell people calling out racism is as easy as telling somebody that farted in a, in a, in a room. Can you, can you go do that over there? Can you, can you, can you go over there with that? 
you don't want that, right? That's how I feel about it. And I don't know how more basic to explain right. it. But like, don't bring that over here. <laughs> thank you again so much before we leave because we're almost out of time yes, and i yes. wish we had more time with you i'm so sorry but we'll have to do a part um, two please tell me where we can uh learn more about your work do you have a website social media account or youtube that we can check out yes yes so most of my stuff is going to be on my link tree which is i believe linktree.com slash camp franklin uh, okay. But I do most of my updates on everything on my Twitter, actually, which is just twitter.com slash Cam Franklin. And from there, I usually share everything. I will have a website soon and have more, more things coming soon. But uh, if you really want to keep up with my busiest thing, it's going to be everything at thesuffers.com because that's, <laughs> that's my, my pride and joy and my, my main focus these days. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Cam, for joining us. And thank to our you. viewers, thank you so much. Our next event will feature the film screening of 13th. This event will take place next Thursday, February 11th at 6 p.m. Central. You can register at our website at hmh.org backslash events. Please feel free to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Boniac Center and and at HMHOU. And for more information on Houston Coalition Against Hate, check out their website at www.houstonagainsthate.org. Again, thank you again, Cam, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a great evening.